Almost from the onset of the coronavirus epidemic in the United States, New York has been described as the epicenter of the outbreak, and Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, the epicenter of the epicenter. Obviously, Elmhurst Hospital in Queens is right now the epicenter within the epicenter. Elmhurst Hospital is the epicenter of the epicenter. And Elmhurst Hospital is really at the center of this crisis here in the city and in the country with doctors desperately trying to keep up with the growing number of patients as supplies dwindle. And you see the black body bags? You say, what's in there? It's Elmhurst Hospital. Must be supplies. It's not supplies, it's people. Also from the beginning of the crisis, Ventilators were described as essential life-saving equipment, initially in short supply. You pick the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. I knew that every person who needed a ventilator and didn't get one would die. But why does New York, and Elmhurst in particular, appear to have been hit so much harder than other places in the United States? And were ventilators ever the right approach to treating COVID-19, especially once we realized that 60 to 90% of those vented do not survive? The experience and observations of nurse Erin Olszewski seem to offer some answers to these pressing questions, while simultaneously providing frontline information about a number of other hot-button topics, including the disproportionate number of COVID deaths among Americans of color, the distortion surrounding do not resuscitate orders, the disregard for personal protective equipment standards, and the clustering of COVID positive with COVID negative patients, which she witnessed again and again, and the tremendous amount of nosocomial or hospital acquired infections that resulted. Perhaps most urgently of all, she speaks of the therapies and protocols employed in her home state that did work. Aaron was brought from Florida by a service funded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. She spent almost a month at Elmhurst. What she saw there compelled her to become a reporter and whistleblower alongside her already extensive nursing duties. She made recordings, posted warnings on social media, and spoke through proxies about the nightmare condition she witnessed. Erin was raised in Wisconsin and enlisted in the Army when she was 17, just before 9-11. She deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003. Part of her duties involved overseeing aid disbursement and improvements to hospital facilities. While in country, she received the Army Commendation Medal for meritorious service and was wounded in combat. Erin eventually retired as a sergeant and became a civilian nurse in 2012. A mutual friend who was helping her make hidden camera recordings introduced us to Erin. After working a long shift at the hospital, she agreed to do an impromptu interview in her room at the Marriott Marquis overlooking Times Square. We encourage the viewer to leave aside their preconceptions about the nature of what is happening, to hear firsthand from an eyewitness who at great personal expense and without political prejudice of any kind now openly reports what she discovered in the hopes that the information will be put to good use to save lives. She began by telling us one of her most disturbing findings, that people who had repeatedly tested negative for COVID were being described as COVID confirmed. Okay, so if you look close, I'm in my patient's chart. I am pulling up like their laboratory results. So if you look here, you'll see COVID-19 bioreference lab. Here are the test results. As you can see, 5-1-2020 at 17-16, uh, not detected. They test for a second time, 5-4-2020 um, at 17-59, not detected. So both of those are negative. Scroll up to the top, this is my patient. They are on a vent and they are being called COVID-19 confirmed, droplet in contact and eye protection. So this person is droplet and I COVID confirmed, positive A, click, not detected, no resulting lab available. Oh, pretty good. 
while Erin was using her hidden camera to document another chart showing a patient with negative test results who nonetheless was labeled COVID confirmed, another travel nurse entered the room. They began to discuss what Aaron was seeing. If it says bioreference, that's that here. It's done here. So not detected here, but so it's presumptive. Now they're all. But they are detected. They're saying it's positive, not detected. But it's not what detected. Does that say? What does that mean? So I you said that they were vented immediately upon being brought in. Is that? Yeah. So the thing is, is they're coming in with difficulty breathing. And a lot of these patients are really coming in with anxiety because everybody is, they're scared. And when I was back home, um, I was working in the ED out in the tents. And most people that were coming through were coming through with like symptoms of just, you know, anxiety or, you know, they're worried and they're breathing fast and then they get all nervous. They, so this is how the people are like coming in. Now I'm not saying that some of them, you know, don't have COVID, like there are, there is, there are people that come in and they really do need help, not to the extent of event, but they need help. But these other people, like this person who wasn't COVID multiple times, you know, and a lot of them are on either Medi Medicaid or Medicare. They're poor. Um, they're from, you know, a lower class. We're at a public hospital. They need the funding. So take them. They take them. Um, and they tell them pretty much that if they don't get on a vent, then they're probably not going to survive. But the reality is, if they get on that vent, the likelihood of them walking out the hospital is slim to none. And can I ask you, what like PEEP are they on? And is that being mandated or specified what the pressure is on the vent? Here's the thing with this. So you don't have actual doctors that know critical care, ICU doctors on these floors, there's a dentist and there are residents with these. So residents are essentially students um, and they have no idea what they're doing. Like I had to police, actually today I had to police a resident because he wrote an order for me to run um, Versed, which is a medicine that you have to be very careful with because it can kill someone at like quadruple the speed of what you should be running it at the dose. And had I not known that, then I would have easily killed the patient. And it would have been okay under their COVID standards. So everything is kind of a wash. Nobody's held accountable for anything. And these people that are at events are essentially being like, they're, these residents are like practicing their skills on them. So they're practicing central lines, they're practicing like invasive procedures that are really unnecessary. What is the percentage of black, Latino, white? What, what, what's the racial composition? Hispanic and black for the majority. And what's the age and range? Asian. And Asian. And what's the age range? 20 year olds all the way up to 70, 80 year olds. Very, very few, I should say very few 80 year olds, but. The majority of people, I would say, are in their 40s or 50s. Wow, and what percentage of the people that are in there do you, would you say actually have tested positive for COVID? Um, half, probably half. But everyone is being treated as though? The entire hospital is COVID. So half the hospital is not COVID, but they're on COVID floors. So. Let me just ask you about nosocomial infection. So you're saying they're putting non-COVID or COVID rule out with definite COVID patients. Yes. So I was only wondering, cause like I was looking at like all the patient rooms and like this patient is in with like a non-COVID. I don't, I don't understand why they're doing that. I know there's four patients in a row here yeah. that are non-COVID. And this is supposed to be the COVID thing, Yeah. Seventh floor, they've shut it down. That's right. I'm, it, I'm confused. And then they are going to have non COVID there. Yeah. This is going to be the only COVID. So they shouldn't put any non COVID here. Well, that's what they've been doing. They're banking on the fact that they'll get it because they're already immunocompromised. So they're just. They're, and they'll put them in the same room. So there's double rooms. So you have a COVID with a non COVID. They don't even care. We have enough rooms where they can be separated now because it's not as busy as it was, you know, four weeks ago, um, but they don't care. They're just putting them together. I have that right now happening. 
Like the guy over I in I had two twenty yeah. that were two negatives. And they they end up positive. Like the guy over in twenty nine, I had him upstairs because I was on CCU before it. Yeah. And he came in with a, a with a stroke. I know. That's what twenty six one was. A stroke. It and no COVID. Nothing. And now it. he's got COVID and he's on a vent. Well, because we gave it to him here. She. I don't know how this ended up being COVID central. I uh, know, uh, but she she literally came in with a broom. And then she left like five minutes later. My patient had died of COVID and she didn't mop the floor. She was cleaning, getting prepared for my next patient and she didn't mop the what? floor. I was like, that is the That's least standard. Mop the I, yeah. I didn't think I had to tell her that. Right. People don't know how to properly wear their PPE. Let's go back to Ebola. Like when Ebola was here, people took that very seriously. You have a... Uh, you have a nurse in the room in all the head to toe PPE. This is Ebola. This is, this is, I'm going to compare it. And you have another nurse that's outside the room handing supplies, you know, the, the clean nurse and the dirty nurse, right? Going and when they're taking their, th their outfit off the, you know, one nurse is unzipping the back so she can take it out, walking out. Mm. They're not doing that. Here, we're wearing like our scrubs. And then we have maybe like a net top. Our pants are exposed. They're wearing booties over their shoes, but the booties are going room to room to room. And then people will wear them through the hospital. So there's massive spread just yeah. through the, the improper use of the PPE. I mean, that's, it's a no brainer. Everyone, it looks good. It looks good. It looks like you're super safe, but in reality it's, ridiculous so you're gonna go to you'll go room to room you'll maybe take that top off put a new top on but the rest of you is still exposed but i mean why are they doing this know, you know? know suspected suspected and then there's like uh ho principal hospital does that mean a, like a nosocomial is that what that means like we have in the united states and we've had it for a while a rapid test it's 45 minutes. Do you have COVID, don't you? Um, they're not They're not doing the rapid test here. They're not? No. They, mm -mm. Okay. I, I, At Elmhurst, you've never seen no, them. Nope, they don't do it. It's too expensive. They do five day. It's like five to seven day turnaround. In the meantime, they admit them onto COVID units. So non-COVIDs, the rule outs are going to COVID units and waiting for the results. Even though we have a rapid result, which is 45 minutes, and they're not doing it. No, not one. But would you say it's too expensive? I mean, isn't this all getting charged to the fund anyway? I mean, why not do it? Why not? Are you, are you saying that? I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I asked that doctor <clears throat> about it. How come you guys don't do the rapid test here? <laughs> The place. I mean, it's, it exists, it's just they don't have access to it. It's only limited supply, so if you have deep pockets, you get it first. Mm. Oh, so money. Most times it's money about everything, yes. That's sad. It's a reality. I compare this hospital to a third world country. I've been in a third world country hospital in Iraq. The Iraq hospital is better than this one, and that says a lot. I've been there. I, I've had, I've been in both hospitals and we're this is in the United States and this hospital is treating low income mostly um, people and it almost makes me feel like they think these people are disposable and they're not they're 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 people you know everybody people are not disposable you know, especially, especially these, the ones that are struggling day in and day out, the hard workers, you know, like trying to reach that American dream and they're not given a chance because they're brought to this place where nobody cares. And is there uh, a, an understood financial incentive to diagnose COVID? Yeah, of course. So. In the hospital that I'm in right now, it's all COVID at this point. 
every single floor is COVID and they made it that way, obviously, um, for a reason, in my opinion, but the, a person cannot come to the floor unless they have a COVID diagnosis. Is the reason, did they not want to cross contaminate? Is that, would that be the legitimate reason why to, you would create an all COVID floor? Um, here's why I will say no to that is because they're admitting people for quote COVID rule out. So this guy was probably admitted COVID rule out, tested him. They saw that it came back negative. They probably already did something where they needed to now call him COVID in the hopes that if they're putting him on a COVID floor and there's nurses going room to room to room, he will get it. And then they'll be, you know, they'll be back to when he does pass that he did have COVID. Now, I mean, that's, that's quite, you know, that's quite a charge. I mean, what, what makes you think they really want them to, to get COVID because it, money, uh, mm. Money. It's. I think it's at least twenty nine thousand dollars per per patient, and then you have to think you are also charging supplies and more supplies and more supplies. That's just like a bonus money. But what the, do the but the residents aren't getting that right? I mean, why? why? Oh, that's the thing. And I actually had a. I've went at it with a, a lot of residents already, and um, they're they're order followers. So. There was a resident, and I have this on tape. I video, I taped it because it was just so disgusting to me. Um, a 37 year old, um, which is my age, um, was not a DNR. He's a full code. His family, in depth, discussed with the doctors that they want us to do everything they can to save him. He came in talking. He was very terrified. He was just like you know, totally alert knew what was going on and they convinced him to be on a vet. Now he's dead. But the doctor said when I got into shift that um, if he codes that we are not to resuscitate or try to save him. And we flipped. This is important. I just asked them if we can put a DNR order and they said no. That's up to the attending. Okay, so we're going to code him. That's what I said and they said no we're not. I said yes we are. We're obligated to. So then I you got to say something though, like it's our license. Unfortunately, you guys got to put in an order, or just something. Th that's what I said. Yeah. I said I'm obligated. Yeah. What did she so say? So then she's like, the higher up said. I said I don't care what they said. Yeah. What higher up? God? We don't have a God yeah. here making I said, decisions. I said I don't care what they said. So we're supposed to. He's not DNR, but we're treating it as DNR. Basically. Basically. Does his family know? His family knows the situation. They, I think they called them and they told them. Um, they were trying to do a school attendance for uh, being on. Okay. All day he spent like in the 80s saturating. <clears throat> it was the, the, this one on the forehead didn't work. It was this, this one worked. And yeah. it came back. When I changed it, I was like, oh shoot, it's 90. Yeah. So they started playing around with the Oh shoot, it's 90. He, still on he changed right. the pulse ox you put him on AC from drop. his head to his finger and well, yeah, he's like, oh, it's 90. He's fine. He's so, yeah. so what was that? So that was, we were just getting on shift because we we're starting the night shift at seven. And that was the nurse from the day shift saying pretty much we shouldn't code him if he's going to code. And then I turned my glasses on. Why are we being told not to to code him, essentially, that's what he said. I mean, because I'm going to tell you right now, if he bottoms out, I'm jumping on his chest. Period. Point blank. It's going to happen. Okay. Because until that status is changed in the computer, that's what I'm obligated yeah. to do under I mean, my I'll, nursing license. Right. I mean, I'll... Because uh, you guys aren't going to back me up and protect me. Well, Elmhurst does have a, a policy given, like a COVID policy, given right. the scarcity of... Right. Dialysis be, and blood. It can be a chem code. It can be whatever. That it's not. There's not a. It's a difference. Normally, the standard is whatever the family right. says. Like we just do. So right. they would say code him for a five years. Like we just do that right. until they die. Um, it's a little bit different now because of the new policy in place with right. our neighborhood in place, which is that you don't need full family can like you can just tell someone that it's medically futile and that we're not right. willing to just pour blood and resources into something that 
is would be impossible to get back. Right. But I look, it's he's thirty seven. I mean, it's brutal. Well, so they, they tried. Well, our higher ups have agreed, and our attendings agree that this is futile care at this point. He is not going to make it. I said he doesn't have an epi drip going. He doesn't have anything to sustain going. And I said, and who decided this? And I said, can you put a comfort care order in that? No, we can't do that. Can you put a DNR order in? No, we can't do that. I said, so what's our plan? Do we well, have modified? Well, she him? goes, well, he's dying. And I'm like, I understand that, but there needs to be an order indicating that either I'm doing compressions or I'm not doing compressions. Well, I can say that we can all be in agreement that we will do it. I will definitely. Because I'm going to jump on him. Yeah. So will I. I'll go yes. right with you. I don't care. That's what we. That's what we're here for. I'm not playing like, like these stupid games. Like until they change his status, that he is a DNR, and they can do a true physician consent if they've talked to the family. Yeah. But until they change it, and I see it, he's a full code to me. Well, what if we know when someone is, we're close. We'll pull the code card up and be ready. You know, we're ready. I had the epi ready. That's one of the first things we do and she wouldn't let me give it. So this was that woman and the entire time and this was over his over his body his alive body and we're arguing and she's laughing, she was smirking and how that how this this man died was the nurses arguing with the doctors over him as he was dying. And she's smirking the entire time. I was a, so, it was probably one of the worst experiences in my entire life. But all I can think about is that at least he knows that we were fighting for him. When he died, you know. But this was my conversation after, after what happened and the guy I told you about earlier that had pulled his tube out, he was up at that point. Like he was on the same floor. He had pulled his, he was the one that they wanted to sedate. So he, at that point he was doing better where he could walk. This doctor had put a diaper on him and told him to poop in his pants. So after the code, I went to go check on him and he's poop he has he goes I have poop in my pants I'm like why do you have poop in your pants and he said that because the doctor told him that he has to do that and I just lost it it was her this is wrong it is straight up this it is wrong and I have been I am 37 years old I have been in a hospital since I've been 16 military what hospitals that well what aspect of it was wrong to you I, I agree that there were parts of it that were wrong too. So. Calling a patient a DNR when there's no order for it and I telling agree. us, like straight up telling us, you're not doing anything. That's wrong. If that was my brother or my father or anybody, I would be furious. And I guarantee you, if I called his family right now and told them what, what happened, they would be furious too. I flipped, I, we were all crying. There's a lot of nurses that, that, were, that, that know that this is wrong but they're afraid to like say anything publicly. She said, when I was talking to her, she said, we don't always, we're not always giving the orders that comes from the top down. And I was thinking, that's the exact problem with everything. Where's it coming from? What's the purpose? Are you guys really trying to kill everybody like everybody thinks? Within our unit, um, we, it was a big fight and ultimately the kid died with us over his body arguing about this. The girl's over there. Yeah. And then the doctors, the, he's like, the doctor will just write it up that we, that we, uh, you know. Yeah, I don't trust it. him though, because I don't know him. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. There's a doctor that came upstairs that I had worked with prior. He was working in the ED and heard what happened. He came into the room with me and told me that what I did was good and that you know, so there are good doctors in here, you know, the, the, I guess the word traveled after this. You mentioned earlier that this, that this is a common occurrence where people come in able to speak and they just have low oxygen levels and then and they're put on a vent. Is, so what, what's, what, what's going on there? Um, I don't know. I honestly, I, I have no idea how they're assuming everybody is just the same. It, there's no individuality anymore. These residents 
I think a lot of them are just stone cold, you know, there's no emotion and they don't view people as people anymore. And it's really sad, like we came, I came a little bit later, you know, after the big rush, but there were still a lot of people coming in and a lot of us are, were just in shock. Within the first couple days, you could see exactly what was going on. My bigger problem with this whole scenario is when they intubate people who don't need it. Yeah. And it looks very clear to me that they're just pushing it. You almost feel like you are literally living in the twilight zone. And you feel like you're the only sane one in a bunch of insane people. And it's scary because these are the people that others are trusting to take care of them. And they're really doing the opposite. I'm to the point where I'm afraid that I'm gonna start thinking that this is normal. <laughs> I don't wanna ever get to that point because they think that, like the people I work with that are local nurses and doctors don't see anything wrong with this. Really? I mean, they, they don't, is, no. do they see, was, was it just like kind of a hard past few months? Is it, or? Th this has been like this. And from what I hear, like from, I, I mean, there are really, there are good nurses that work there too. Like I have, made good friends with a lot of the nurses that do work there there's good people but they're outnumbered what, so what happens the people come in like this 37 year old and what was he complaining of or what was going respiratory on respiratory distress he didn't have covid either he he did not have covid and how do we know that i ha i took care of him i have the same type of um results from his chart as i do with my other patient it was like the day before intubation he was fine on the yeah. rebreather and then they intubated and then he got a new mold and then they put in a and, and now he's 37 years old and dead yeah. that's what i'm seeing like all these negative tests <laughs> and they're and they're putting them on these vents it, hopeful that they'll get it. They're being put on these COVID floor is murder. It, it straight up is, it is setting these people up for failure based on money. But Medicaid is who pays out or who's paying this bonus of 29,000? I think, I believe it's medic, Medicaid, Medicare. Hmm. It's government money, but I don't know exactly where it's coming from, but I know that it is, but I know the orders are coming from uh, the above, someone above, and everybody says that it's someone higher up. I'm like, good, call them. Like during that DNR when they're telling us, or the the full code when they're telling us not to, you know, do CPR. Um, I'm like, all right, call your higher ups then. Let's talk about. And they wouldn't, because they're all scared. Everybody's scared. And everybody's scared to stick up for themselves. And I've called a lot of doctors unethical to their face and they deserve it. I am a nurse. I'm an advocate for my patients. And yeah, to the flip side of it, but I totally agree. But we no, 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 just wait. If there's a DNR. You, you were laughing and you thought it was funny. You were like smirking. You're being really rude to all of us. I, and I thought that was really, di I'm not being rude in that it was really, yeah, you are. It was very disrespectful. And I don't think that you're going to be a very good doctor. Okay. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we I hope you learned something from this. Yeah. Was this the dentist or was this, or these are residents you're talking um, to? This one was a fellow. Mm. She was a CCU fellow. Uh, cardiac. She was a cardiac fellow. What killed him? Was being, did the vent kill him? Yeah. Oh, yes. They're so sedated. He had probably eight or nine drips. It's all sedation. It's all sedation and uh, paralytics. So you are asleep. It, it is essentially like you're you're under, you know, you're in surgery, you know, when they put you under like that um, for a good month straight. There's no way you can recover from something like that. You're so, brain dead if you do. So, so can you list some of the drugs that they're put on on the drips yeah there's propofol fentanyl nimbex um versed gosh hang on i have a list i think it lists from this is one of my one of my patients was on this just one patient 
so Nimbex, 100 milligrams, Presidex, 400 milligrams, Fentanyl, 2,500 micrograms, Heparin, 25,000 units, Versed, 50 milligrams, Levofed, 16,000, Neo, 50 milligrams, Propofol, 10 milligrams, Vesopressin, 100 units. This is one person, and there, all these drips are running at the same time into them. So in the case of this 37 year old, he comes in complaining of some respiratory distress. Did he have low ox blood oxygen? Totally healthy guy. Um, and he was satting like a satu like that's the oxygen saturations in like 88, 89. So a little low. I mean, yeah, but people do that. You and I probably do that. We're, we're not monitoring our oxygen, you know, all day long. But he, but he felt shortness of breath so he came in yes and and what was the next step what what, what would have happened next um he went to a step down unit um a, among other what does COVID. that mean sorry it's just a unit that where people aren't quite on the vent yet and i say on the vent yet because that's i should call it step up unit to the vent but so are, was he, can, do they, what's the phrase you used? COVID, uh, COVID rule out. COVID rule out. So that's how they admit everyone to the floor that doesn't have a positive COVID immediately. Okay. So he's put in the step down unit, which is a euphemism for step up unit. Yeah. And what happens to him there? What's going on there? Um, oxygen. I wasn't in this unit. My friend was. Um, it, it, so just normal yeah. oxygen, a nasal? No, they'll do like a high pressure. Um, so what does that mean exactly? What does it look like? It's pretty much like a forced, it's a big, it almost looks like a big thick nasal cannula and you mm. put it in your nose and it forces the pressure in. It can almost be like, you know, it, it, it's still causing your lungs to expand, right? But what they really need to be doing is like the non-rebreather mask, but they just skip it usually. They go right to the high pressure, so your their lungs are already, you know. So and tell just tell us what a non-rebreather mask is. So that's just the, there's a, ba a bag that is on the end of these masks. It's not forcing air down your lungs. Okay. It's more natural. <clears throat> okay. You know, um, you can put a hundred percent oxygen. And that's what people need. That. Yeah. Okay, so and and that really is not the protocol. It's not the protocol to start people on that. I mean, it should be, but it's not how they're doing it now. I mean, in in your prior experience dealing with people with low saturation, would would that be what you would oh, do? Oh yeah, that's what we were doing, you know, in my my hometown. And were you having better outcomes yeah, there? Yeah, we didn't have this because we treated them properly, <laughs> you know. What was what would you say the kind of the case fatality rate was None. in your... zero. Yeah, by me, zero. And what's, what, what is the likelihood of coming out of the hospital you're in? I'll tell you that the unit that I've been on, the only person that survived, ironically, is a guy who pulled his own uh, tube out. <laughs> yeah. So he woke up enough to be able to do that? Yeah, he wanted it out. He should have never been on in the first place. That's another, that's a whole nother story. So let's just keep going with this 37-year-old. Yeah. So he's on the step-down unit and he's give, being given sort of semi-pressurized oxygen. It's not a rebreather mask. And then what happens to him? They'll start treating them with medications, you know, that will... I, I and are they checking his saturation at this, uh, all the time? Does he have... Yeah, he's on a continuous pulse ox, but... Mm. You know, the minute that he desats, like they'll see like, oh no, he's at 87 now. Or, oh, look at this. Oh, he's gonna need more help. And then they go tell them that they need more help, even if they don't. You know, it it's ultimately what it comes down to is like people being just lazy and wanting to treat. They just wanna treat, 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 treat. You know. Uh, is, and, there, is there any incentive to the, okay, you're saying that the incentive for the residents is kind of experimental almost. Um, well, they're order followers. And they're, uh-huh. You know, like, they want to please. That's what they're doing. They want to please. And, like, the protocol of that hospital is to treat. To, to treat in, invasively according to this protocol. And do we know where this protocol yeah. originates? I mean, because obviously the governor was talking about getting vents, vents. Everyone was talking about getting vents. So this seems like this comes from well, very high up. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're going to tell somebody, the ent- well, the entire world, essentially, in especially the entire United States, when they're like, we need the vents, like, if you tell people something enough, they're going to start believing it. So that's exactly what happened. Tell me why Cuomo immediately thought two months ago that they'd need 30,000 vents. How do you just come Cuomo's, up with a number? Cuomo's an idiot, too. Well... He, so our 37 year old what happens to him next so they say okay it looks like he's at 87 he needs more and so they do they that is that the point at which they would intubate him yeah that's when he went to the that's when he stepped up so he stepped up to the icu he steps up to the icu more care right they start off with a little bit of like muscle relaxer and um you know he's woozy you have to remember there's no family with these patients so they're alone and in hospital by themselves during a pandemic that they're terrified of already that's likely what brought him in in the first place he's totally healthy otherwise and then you have doctors they think they're doctors but they're they're resident technically they're doctors with absolutely zero experience. I've had to teach residents several like nursing skills, um, telling them that they have a choice. You know, like they could likely die from this, or they can be saved by you know getting a tube and that will help them breathe. They don't call it ventilator. We can give you a little help breathing, and that's it. Then they get then they get the sedation and they went they go to sleep. And that's it. They don't wake up. He's in a body bag. And do you, so the drugs have a deleterious effect on the body, on the brain. But is there something about the pressurization of the lungs that is also causing harm? Yeah, they're, they're having the pee. That's the pressure in his lungs, which is causing the sparrow trauma. of people. It's blowing people's lungs out. So when that happens, what do you got to do? Turn it up more. You know, you just you just keep because the membrane expands so that you yeah. need in order to fill them and deflate them, you need more pressure. Yeah, you're going to have to max it. I mean, we have a guy right now who's maxed out on everything. There's nothing more you can do. So then what? You just wait for them to die. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Can you tell us what PEEP levels are they started on? It depends. It They're always usually, well, they'll start, there's some good, There's. I can't say everybody's bad. Mm-hmm. There are some good doctors that'll start them out on five, which people should be at about five. Mm-hmm. But that doctor goes home and the next doctor comes on shift and cranks it up, then what? It's hard to go back down. And what, uh, what oxygen level are they put on? It depends. I mean, as they start to deteriorate more and more, then the oxygen obviously is going up. There's a guy right now, I have him on 100%, and I'll have to come in and, you know, give him a little bit more rush of um, two minutes of even more oxygen just to keep his stats up. I mean, that's what happens to people. In your home state where you we're treating people, what would the protocol be? Um, our, I mean, it, it varied upon each individual, mm. you know, um, but we, we definitely would never go immediately to, you know, you're going to need a vent. Um, you didn't feel pressure to diagnose people, people that there wasn't a pressure to diagnose people COVID? Not at all. No. It, we're not a public hospital too that makes a huge difference I, I what i'm seeing is it's the public hospitals and this is like in other states too if you look at all the hospitals most of them are public that are needing money but our hospital would just treat them based on the individuals you know and they were using the hydroxychloroquine and the zinc and you know that protocol for sure at your hospital oh yeah and that seemed to work yeah we didn't have anybody that died i think there was one patient that was admitted and went home like the day day later and we're in i'm in a you know a pretty big city so and were these people with 
who were elderly with comorbidities who were having good outcomes? Um, yeah, actually one guy came, the, the one guy that was admitted came from a nursing home and he was obese, like severely overbeat, obese. And, and he, and he, and he yeah, left, he's fine. Uh, he left after a day? Um, I think, well, I think it was like a night, maybe, maybe two nights max, but. And, and what, do you remember what he was treated with? Um, I didn't have him on the floor, but, um, I can't, I can imagine he was treated with the protocol that we would prescribe the patients before they left the emergency room. Which was? Which, the hydroxychloroquine zinc. Why do you think that's been demonized so much? Um, cause it's working and then people wouldn't need vents. <laughs> <laughs> Only on two tonight, a Houston hospital's having success treating the coronavirus patients. In fact, mm -hmm. its recovery rate is perfect. Fascinating, isn't it? To treat patients here, Dr. Veron is using an experimental drug protocol. It's a cocktail of vitamins, steroids, and blood thinners. Each patient also is getting hydroxychloroquine, the malaria drug touted by President Trump. The protocol is controversial because there hasn't been time for extensive testing, but Dr. Veron says it works. We've treated over 40 plus patients with this uh, treatment and we haven't had a single complication. So far, he says, none of his patients have died. This is time of war. There is no time to double blind anything. This is, uh, this is working. And if it's working, I'm gonna keep on doing it. What we're finding clinically with our patients is that it really only works in conjunction with zinc. So the hydroxychloroquine opens the zinc channel, zinc goes into the cell, it then blocks the replication of the, of the cellular machinery. You're prescribing it and it is working for COVID-19 patients. Every patient I've prescribed it to has been very, very ill and within eight to 12 hours, they were basically symptom free. And so wow. clinically, I am seeing a resolution that mirrors what we saw in the French study and some of the other studies worldwide. Um, but what I am seeing is that people are taking it alone by itself it's not having efficacy okay what can you tell us about any confirmed covid cases that you've seen what i mean in both in your home state and here in new york what 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 have you noticed about them and what 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 are their stats look like um okay so the real the real confirmed covids that come in like you immediately know that they're covid because they cannot like they can't breathe. They literally can't breathe. So they do need that non rebreather mask or their SAS will like quickly drop to, you know, 60s, 70s. You want to do it around, you know, 90 to 100. So they can't talk even. Mm -hmm. well, Some or... of them can talk. A lot of this is anxiety. But the problem with this is they're be they were being told, the public has been told to self quarantine, right? Mm. Stay home. That's a problem because these people could be getting early, early treatment. This clinical trial is emerging that appears to show that it decreases severity early in the game, before you end up hospitalized, before you end up on a ventilator. And they're not because they were told to stay home. So now they're getting really, really sick and they come in on an emergency status. They waited too long. If they didn't wait too long, they're easily treatable. And, and easily treatable, you feel, with some of these treatments yeah, what, like 100%. zinc and hydroxychloroquine yeah. and, you know, so any, it's, yeah. It's working. I mean, it's been, it's been proven to work. There's a doctor, I think, in Texas that's, you know, using that protocol and a shot in the butt, you know, of uh, antibiotic shot. I don't know exactly which one she was using. And she's successfully treating. And um, she was saying that the, the pharmacist now is calling her every time that she prescribes, you know, the, the hydroxychloroquine and asking what the diagnosis was of the patients in order to give it to them. I'm like, that's a doctor-patient relationship. So the, he, the pharmacist, I guess, was told to do this. And, you know, in New York, the, the governor said, you know, pretty much put a ban on it. So why? Why? What made him? you know, a medical professional now to make these decisions and intrude on the doctor-patient relationship. Because you're I think I it. know, mm. you know, I've seen it. it it's, they, they want a vent. He wants to be right. They requested all these vents, they want to use them. As part of the same executive order that granted hospitals near blanket immunity from malpractice litigation during the epidemic, 
Governor Cuomo singled out hydroxychloroquine as the one drug that could not be used as an off-label therapy for COVID-19, except as a part of approved studies. The order was issued ostensibly to prevent hoarding so that those who take this decades-old inexpensive treatment with a long safety record for approved conditions like lupus would have access to it. He later amended the order to allow hydroxychloroquine's use in later stage patients in hospitals, but not in early outpatient treatment. Both hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine had shown efficacy in the prior SARS coronavirus epidemic, and studies in France and other countries had already shown its effectiveness for COVID-19. But instead of making research and production of a promising therapy a priority so that there wouldn't be shortages, vents became the near-exclusive focus, along with the search for a vaccine. This has been true even of President Trump, who despite his public cheering for hydroxychloroquine, has not made it the focus of warp speed funding and testing. A number of U.S. studies have shown the promise of hydroxychloroquine-based therapies, most recently a Yale University study focused on early treatment. And in what may be the most scandalous retraction in recent memory, a Lancet paper that purported to show hydroxychloroquine alone or with other therapies was in fact dangerous has been shown to be based on fraudulent data. Aaron's home hospital system confirmed in a phone conversation with perspectives on the pandemic that they have used a protocol involving hydroxychloroquine and zinc to great effect. Because in your view, this should be an individually decided doctor-patient choice. Everything should be that. I mean, there is no reason that any government should get in between a doctor-patient relationship. That, that's none of their business. You know, it, the, if anything is HIPAA protected, it should be that. I, I mean, when you think about it, it's sickening. It's the same reason they won't use like other treatments that are being that are successful around the world. And I had a conversation with a doctor about this. Are you guys doing like different sorts of like treatments? Because I know like nothing works. They have. Yeah, but I mean, there's, you know, they're coming out with different things I that know. are in the testing It's phase. the same thing they come with a track on them that kill more people than actually save. Uh -huh. So that's one. And he said that they don't work anyway. And I told him, well, obviously what you guys have going on here isn't working. So what's the harm in trying? I don't expect any of these people to survive. 90% uh -huh. of them would die. I mean, it's just maintaining. So I figured if it's assumed they're gonna die anyway, yeah. just try Why not throw a few. Well, it's you know, yeah. I I don't know. That's that's always an issue in medicine whether you should just throw things whether they're dying anyway or not. I. But if you could find a cure. Well, yeah, I mean, there's like no cure, so there's can. no antiviral therapy. The only way to do it is a cure. But I uh, there's or no treatment. I should say Re yeah. rephrase you treatment. Could, you could <laughs> treat it, but but you know, it's you have to have some scientific basis for whether these things are working or not, and just throwing everything at them, you could make them worse. Uh -huh. So, ah, worse you than know, death? Huh? Worse than death? Well, we you said 90%, maybe the 10%, maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> the two, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, hmm. but, I mean, if there's no basis for it working, I mean, you wouldn't just try things just because. I, mean. I would. Well, I might, if it could yeah. save my life. <laughs> yeah, hell but yeah. So, with these actual COVID patients, they, they present by not really being able to breathe. Maybe they've, um, as you say, they've probably waited too long. They're not able to breathe and some of that's anxiety. And and what else, so what else do they, What how, how else do they present? Um, so their lungs, if you look at their x-rays, you can immediately see that these patients are affected by COVID because they're white. Their lungs are white. And the secretions are really really thick mucousy and white and that's what the the photo or the x-ray of these lungs look like and what, so what does a white lung look mean what is that is that just is that mucus yeah in the lung? it's coated it's almost like their lungs are coated um so so that makes it hard to obviously transfer yeah. oxygen into the bloodstream and yeah. so okay so they've got very mucousy lungs and how how do you deal with that is that what hydroxychloroquine and zinc do? Or? I mean, those treatments are for 
beginning stages. Mm. Like once you get to the stage where your lungs are looking like that and you're having a lot of trouble breathing, mm. there are proven treatments that have passed like, three trials in Asia through Dr. Chang, he's a US board certified physician, um, is this like extremely high dose IV vitamin C. He's successfully treating people with that. And what that's doing is it's giving your body, essentially your lungs, like the power, the mm. antioxidant power to kick it out mm. while you can be getting IV antibiotics to be treating this and getting rid of it. But they don't want to have anything to do with it here. What they want to do is just throw them on a vent and sedate them. Yeah. Have you done the high dose IV vitamin C that's successful no, in Asia? No, that doesn't work. What do you mean? Other stuff that's like people trying all kinds of silly stuff. There's no scientific it, basis for vitamin C to be working here. And, and, so, uh, well, the Dr. Chang, he was the one that it went through the the that high dose i'm talking super high dose iv vitamin c that's super antioxidants tell it's your body fight that yeah. um it passed three three trials and it's being effective it's just weird how like everybody yeah, just like no, no, shuts it down immediately because it's the vitamin d vitamin c story has been around for a very long time oh but that's weird because i take it daily and yeah. i'm not i haven't been may, sick and just a good gene if you're not getting sick i don't think it's from vitamin c you may just have good genes so how quickly, how quickly, do, so if you have a, a COVID and a COVID rule out or a non-COVID right next to each other on vents, will the COVID patient die more quickly than the non-COVID patient? If they're on vents, no, they're both the same at that point. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So even though the COVID patient with the, you know, presenting with a very mucousy lung, I mean, are, are their lungs filled or they're just yeah. coated? I shouldn't say that. I'll take that back. Um, it really depends on the person, how healthy they were before. Mm. That really determines how long that they're going to be able to sustain the paralytics and you know sedation and multiple different just procedures. Even when you're like sleeping or you're like you know knocked out, sedated. And they're putting you through like these central lines that they're putting in and mm. trachs. They're doing trachs, even though it, they're practicing essentially. Your body knows what's going on. It's still going through trauma. It's very traumatic, even when you're under. That's why a surgery it takes a while to recover from because you'll feel it for you know how long do you feel that if you've ever had a surgery. And so they're putting in their bodies. They're through ever you know through horrible things and that's adding more stress it's killing them yeah so the guy that pulled out his tube is really unique um because i saw him from the minute he he got to our unit and i didn't agree with him coming to the icu but he was admitted with um hyperglycemia which is high blood glucose um at like 700 so it's pretty high. I learned later that it was high because they were treating him with a lot of different psych drugs and that increases, it, he, it was the treatment that got him to the 700. And when you have a blood glucose that high, you're automatically gonna have altered mental status. So now they called him crazy, okay? So he's admitted to the ICU and everyone's like, well, why is he here? Because he was acting, you know, he was acting out. He didn't know where he was. He was confused. And I went in there and he wasn't my patient, but you know, we help each other. And I went in there and I tried to talk to him and calm him down. Like, hey, he's just like, I just want to get out of here. I want to get out of here. He has soft restraints on. So he's, they, they restrain everybody. We have soft restraints on all of our patients, the majority of them for sure, which is, I think is crazy, but it goes with, it goes with the territory because everybody's really lazy and it's easier to just treat them with drugs or tie them to their beds. So he was tied up. Obviously, what is that going to do? It's going to make, you're tied up in a hospital. You don't have any family. What do you think you're going to, you're going to freak out. So he was, and his oxygen was sitting at, you know, 88, you know, 87 doctor comes in. I should say fellow comes in and she says that if he can't get his, if she goes, 
if you can't get your breathing under control, we're going to have to put a tube in you to help you with that. And I go, what? I'm like, he doesn't need a tube down his throat. Like, he doesn't need a vent. She goes, well, yeah, his, he's de-statting. And I said, no, like, absolutely not. He does not need that. We need to get his blood sugar under control and he will be fine and maybe not tied to this bed. And she goes, yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll just monitor him. And this was, I was working night shift. This was probably around 6 a.m. At quarter to seven, we had a code down the hall. Did the, the code passed, had to do all that and got out of there. I come back for a shift and guess what? The guy has been on a vent. <laughs> I was so upset. They did it, I guess the, the nurses that took over said they did it literally as I left. So I come back in the morning and he's on a vent. I'm yep. like, you have to be kidding me. He did not need a vent. They waited for you to leave. They did. We literally, we literally, that was the morning we coded 28 for three minutes. That we no sooner took the vent out of that room, cleaned it and put it in here. Yeah. And tubed him. Yeah, they took his vent after that, he died and happened. put it on him. So they waited until I left because they know how I feel about this stuff. Same thing with bed nine. They didn't need to, to intubate him. He was progressing. I don't think that he... I don't know what happened after we tried BiPAP and then they brought him here and I thought, well, cross my fingers, we'll see. And no one survives. He did. He was the only one that I had. That's what happened with him. But he I, pulled I, his tube out and so he has a chance again. Oh. Oh, he did? He excavated himself. Oh, he did? Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought he <clears throat> was excavated. And how did he wake up? From um, turns out that he did drugs. So he was resistant he was, to he, fentanyl. All of this stuff that we give yeah. normal people didn't cut it for him. <laughs> so he ended up, yeah. I'm like, you just say, oh. I'm like, you just saved your own life, you know? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Don't put that on. Don't put that on. But it, I mean, it, it did. You know what's sad? So he pulled it out. And um, they're like, oh, you know, so-and-so is extubated. And I'm like, no way. They don't extubate anybody. I'm like, that's so weird. And here it turns out he excavated himself. And now, he, I mean, he's fine. He's home now. This was just a couple days ago. But, he, you know, what's sad is that he thinks we saved his life. Mm. You know what I mean? So he's like, you saved me. And I, I couldn't, you know, I don't have the heart to be like, no, man, you saved yourself. You have like nine lives because had he, had he not pulled that out, he would definitely, he would definitely be dead. For sure. They don't extubate anyone. Here's the problem. Not a single patient here since this thing began has been discharged or, or successfully extubated. I asked the um, nursing supervisor for a sitter for the guy that pulled this tube out because when they're waking up, they can be... They, they can be extra, I should say, where they need a little bit of extra attention. And I asked her for a sitter and she told me that I didn't utilize all my resources first, which was held all, all the psych drugs to like chemically, chemically, you know, put him to bed. The, your Florida hospital was literally having to furlough people? Yes, what was happening is obviously they shut down all elective procedures. Um, but they were also waiting for the wave. They called it the wave. So we were preparing and we were in tiers based on our experience. So we were tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. And I was tier one because I have the you know military trauma experience, ICU experience, so on and so forth. So I was working you know, throughout the hospital, training in other units, cross training. Um, ultimately, it was to get hours. <laughs> you know, it, it was what? It was to get hours. Yeah, yeah. You know, this right. is what the hospitals were doing. They're like, okay, we're going to give our employees hours this way to cross train them for when the wave hits. And then that wave would get pushed back another week and then they get pushed back another week and the units that we were floating to like cross training they're like what are you doing here we don't need you <laughs> you know for so 
I felt like I was wasting my time and taking up other other people's time that we're trying to get ours too. And this opportunity presented itself and I took it. Do you think that the reason you never got a COVID wave in Florida was because of any of this lockdown or, I mean, what, I mean, I mean, I know you're not an epidemiologist, but, no, but what, what do you think was so going on? I am, I live right by and that was like worldwide news. People were at the beach. I was one of those people at the beach with my kids. Sunlight, it's vitamin D, it's good for your immunity, fresh air, salt water. All these things are really good for anyone's you know, immune system. You have to be out. Mental health, you know, we were all at the beach. And so people, if there was a lot of transmission going on. Wouldn't it, you think our hospitals would be flooded? They're not. I'm right at the beach. I'm right by the beach. Didn't happen. Because the lockdowns happened after all that and... It was spring break. You know, the beaches were packed. I mean, there's people from all over the world. Like, we're... People are all... I mean, tons of New Yorkers live by us. What do you... What do you if you... I, I know I'm asking you to speculate here. Because you, you really feel... There is something, a new disease called COVID-19, a new, do, do you feel that that's the case? Or do you think that this is, I mean, I know there's a lot of mislabeling and I know all that and, 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 but there really is something new, right? And, and yeah. so, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and how, wh why do you think it, you know, places like New York got, well, okay, we can see that what you were describing at Elmhurst was that they were packing people in together. And so that would cause spread. But wh why do you think a place like New York got hit so much harder than other places? Um, I thought about that already. Um, what I found is that before this happened, because it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, I'm sitting at home. I'm waiting for work. I'm stressing out. A lot of my friends are doing the same. So I'm like digging and like, why is New York like, what, what is it because there's that many people crunched in together? But ultimately what I found is that the hospitals here were already struggling. I think they shut down like multiple hospitals because they couldn't afford to keep them open. So that made sense to me, even though I didn't want it to make sense. <laughs> you know, like there's really no other rhyme or reason. Cause like. But do you think we have, do you think we really do have many more cases regardless of whether or not, you know, people went to the hospital? Um, I think they're forced cases. I mean, sure. People are coming in with, COVID, whatever that may be, it is something, um, but not everyone, but they're admitting these people. That's the difference between New York hospitals or these, you know, Michigan, uh, you know, the, the states that were, you know, hit the hardest quote, um, they're admitting these patients as possible COVID, calling it COVID. Or rule out COVID. Rule or... out COVID. Um, when they maybe just had a little congestion. If there was uh, something you would want to tell everyone in the country and everywhere else, what would, what one last thing, what would it be? <sighs> yeah, well, <laughs> um, I would say this is, this is the, one thing that I've had a struggle with is if someone like me or anybody is trying to tell you something that might go against your beliefs, like just listen, you know, like really just take it in and instead of jumping on it, like think on it for a night or a day and like look into this stuff because, and ask people about it. Um, like, not every nurse is going to have the same experience. A med surge nurse that's on the floor, even in my own hospital, 
has not had the same experience as the ICU nurses have. And once I sit down and explain it to them, it all makes sense. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. We see that because we'll send them to your, you know, so just like, just think about it, you know, and, and be, re be respectful. And like, uh, we don't want to, I don't, no one wants to put themselves in a situation like this, you know, and it's really hard. And this is the reason that a lot more people and nurses are afraid because People are so quick to, you know, defend something that they don't really understand. What are you referring to in particular? Like well, this protocol or what? Like I referred to earlier, if you tell people like something enough over and over, like the media was telling people, you know, vents, 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 vents. And then you say, as a nurse, no vents, you know, it, it's not a good... It's, right. It's not a good position to be in because I'm going against what the government says. But does the government really have everybody's best interest in mind? You know, are they thinking of, you know, the 57-year-old grandma that, you know, wasn't, didn't have to die? Or the 37-year-old that was totally fine when he walked into the emergency room and he didn't have to die? You know, are they thinking about, you know, maybe the guy that had a drug problem that didn't have to be vented, but he saved his own life? I don't have anything to gain. I have everything to lose by sharing what I'm sharing right now, you know, but so be it. You know, I think it's important that these families get closure, and I hope that someday they'll be able to hold them accountable mm -hmm. for what they did. A few days after we recorded this interview, Erin began to feel that her time at Elmhurst was drawing to a close. Her vocal questioning of hospital procedure and her efforts to get the word out on social media were getting noticed. She made this recording on what ended up being her last day at the hospital. I've been taking care of a patient for like a week right now and this is my and I called them and he's been doing great he has a trach put in and he's been doing great he's been talking and like or communicating with me he's telling me like laughing at my jokes and talked to his kids on FaceTime a couple days ago and I told him that I told his kids that he was doing fine and he, and he was and today I was giving him and they came in and they t told me that I need to leave the room and I have to give report to somebody else they took me from that unit and they put me in the emergency room. And they don't need me there, but they put me there. And I'm not even there like 20 minutes. I'm not even there 20 minutes and I hear a code being called in my room that I was just left. And it's him. And he was fine. It was fine. I don't understand. Nothing makes sense. Like, why would they take me out of his room and put me in the ED? And then, not 20 minutes later, he's dead. It doesn't make sense. Like, did they kill him? He was my one patient that was gonna live. He shouldn't have died. I don't know what they did to him. Something's not right.